retain it, retain it, retain it, retain it, retain it, retain it. Hi, my name is Retain Nyamuna and welcome to another exciting episode of the In My Twenties podcast. Yes, this is what I look like behind the mic. Um, this is the first video recorded episode of the In My Twenties podcast from end to end. We usually record in a room, just the mic, me and whoever I'm interviewing, but now given the changes that we've had to adapt and had to make in light of COVID-19 in our work situations, we've decided to go online so that we can keep the conversations coming to you. So coming up on today's episode of the In My Twenties podcast, we speak to an immunologist named Martina, and she's going to be explaining the human immune system and how our body reacts to threats such as bacteria or viral infections. Um, also to let you know, all upcoming episodes of the In My Twenties podcast will incorporate or speak about COVID-19. So we will be talking about the effects on climate change. We'll be chatting to journalists on the front line. We'll be speaking to doctors. And most importantly, we'll be speaking to you at home. We wanna know how you're doing, how you're feeling, how you're coping. So if you wanna feature on the podcast, do let us know. Tag us, message us below. If there is someone who you think would be fantastic for these kinds of conversations, please also let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And finally, we will also be on Instagram Live every Tuesday and Thursday um, on either my personal channel, which you'll be able to find under Retendo Nyamuda, or on the In My Twenties podcast Instagram handle channel as well. Handle channel. Channel handle? Anyway, enjoy today's episode and we'll chat to you soon. Bye-bye. We are live. We are live. We are, live. We, we are very live. Have you turned on the volume on your Instagram, by the way? Oh, I turned down the, the volume on... Or turn down the volume, volume. So now I listen to you through the computer. Okay, you can just hear uh, me sorry, through, through the phone. Okay. All right. I'm still getting a bit of an echo, but it's all good. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's go. Woo! Ha! He. All right. First of all, so hi and welcome to the first Instagram live slash recorded episode of In My... 20s and those of you who are usually um linked in know that we all sing in my 20s um okay so on this episode um uh oh sorry i'm just reading a comment that says there's a lag between the audio and the visual uh we will continue but if it gets really hectic if bad just let us know and we'll try and adjust things on our side um so basically on this episode of the in my 20s podcast we've got a scientist biologist immunologist with us and I'm not going to introduce her, I'm going to let her introduce herself. Um, so take it away. Hi, so welcome everybody. So my name is Martina Szczybiorek and I'm Polish, but I live in South Africa at the moment. I'm immunologist with background in infectious diseases. And currently I'm doing PhD in immunology. immunology. And I work on how your body defends itself from all the nasty pathogens from the outside. So yes, that's basically my background. Fantastic. And so Martina, um, before we dive into the conversation, for those of you watching um, the In My Twenties podcast, well, this podcast is split up into three sections. The first section, we kind of dive into a little bit of Martina's career history and how she got to where she is right now. The second section, we look at the topic of the day, which is immunology and understanding a little bit about our bodies and how it works and its defense mechanisms against diseases or viruses. And then the third section is all about the all-consuming 20s journey and what it is like to be a 20-something year old in this day and age. Um, so first question, Martina, if you could give us some insight into your background. Um, yeah, so actually, where are you from? And what is your career history background? Well, uh, as I mentioned, I'm from Poland, but I live currently in South Africa. So what happened was I was about 21 and I didn't enjoy what I've been living with my life so far. But I've been always feeling this uh, need to do something related to biology and I was fascinated by infectious diseases. And what happened was I uh, ditched my studies that I've been doing at that time and I started moving around uh, to different countries and studying in Netherlands, did some internships in Germany, and then I wanted to go far and I ended up in South Africa at the University of Cape Town. So here I am. 
Uh, I've been offered the, the PhD position at the institute, and that's where I stayed. So, yeah, for past three and a half years, I've been trying to get through my PhD research. And uh, yes, currently, with all the things that are happening um, nowadays worldwide, I'm kind of more pulled back into this infectious diseases aspect of immunology because it's not the same. One thing tells you what your body does, the yeah, other thing is what's out, out there out and how those organisms are living and trying to get around get us and live either by killing us or with symbiotic system so we both benefit from it okay okay and on that uh, kind of note i actually just want to dive into today's topic which is about immunology um so to start off with like how does one define immunology well basically as i mentioned it's a study on how your own body defends itself or reacts to the extra uh, environment so the one that is surrounding us so uh, basically we can react in positive way and we can just accept what is happening around us mm. or we can react in negative way. So we get uh, allergies, for instance, we get some type of inflammations. We might not like uh, things that we consume when it comes to, for instance, gluten sensitivity. Uh, so it's a study that uh, tries to understand what is happening within our body. And when it comes to, for instance, infectious diseases, um, immunologists also look how we protect ourselves or um, some diseases, well, some uh, microorganisms can live uh, in symbiosis with us. So they basically live together with our organism and we equally benefit of it. So like in our guts, we have a, a whole extra world that um, is enormous of and that consists of different microorganisms, in, including bacteria, and they help us with digestion, with all that. And that also has to be orchestrated by our immune system and work together. So immunology itself looks at uh, to the inside of our body. Okay. And so a quick question, when it comes to our immune systems and immunology in general, like I, I mean, after one is born, you basically get best vaccinated against certain diseases um, that you might, you know, get further on. How exactly does that process work? And if you have been vaccinated against something once, do you need to be vaccinated again, or are you always going to be immune to it? Okay, so when it comes to vaccination, I know that there is a lot of controversy around it because people are scared. And I basically, I like to see the world that, you know, that all this controversy comes pretty much from fear, which I understand not everybody likes to be jabbed and stabbed and um, getting some chemicals into the body that you don't necessarily understand. Mm. Um, but when it comes to vaccinations, uh, what people need to understand is that the diseases that we as adults face and we don't get sick, babies don't have this memory so uh, when it comes to your immune system it's a system that needs training it's like an army so when you are born you are born with blank slates you only get the protection from your mother through the breastfeeding worse if you're on the formula for whatever reason um, then you're not even getting that so therefore we have all these vaccination programs in uh, many countries and every country has slightly different regulations it's all uh, either fda directed or european agencies directed and you have series of vaccinations to train those soldiers to protect your body in the future mm. and then there are different types of vaccinations and either you're injected with inactive virus particles and that seems to be uh, protecting you better. So that virus will not replicate in your body, but your body will recognize it. So it's gonna train that, ah, this is the pathogen, this is what I need to fight off. And then the other type of vaccination is uh, the one that people talk about a lot, is the one um, with mercury, and <laughs> people are scared of that. And, um, basically sorry not yeah anyways uh, 
uh, with adjuvant, it's aluminium. Anyways, um, people are scared of that because those are small particles and they are chemically different to what you're learning that it's uh, toxic in your body. And those are vaccinations that um, are consisting of small particles, not the whole micro, the yeah. microbiome. So then when you're getting that into your body, you might need a booster shot because your body will only recognize the small particle, but with, will not know the whole organism. So in a couple of years time, couple of months time, it needs revaccination because it needs to retrain itself. Oh, I see, I see. And so how would you simplify that in general? So what you're basically saying is when it comes to vaccinations, you are injected with a strand or a strain of the actual disease or how, uh, because you say, you say quite a bit, but just to like break it down a little bit, like what exactly are you injected with? Okay. So depends which vaccination. Uh, you are usually injected with a small bit of uh, some kind of infectious agent. From the disease now, of the virus? Of the virus or bacteria. It yeah. depends which vaccination, right. And because those tend to be um, different per area or per season, like when it comes to flu, we try as a scientist, we try to predict what is gonna happen in eight months time because the factories need to have sufficient amount of time to produce this vaccination in particular area. So you're, let's say, predicting that those five types will be there in eight months time. So you are getting injected with those five subtypes. Next year, it might be uh, different subtypes. That's why in case of flu, you have to repeat the vaccination each year. Mm. So your body gets exposed to the whole range of possibilities. Okay. Uh, so a question on that is, so a vaccination is not a cure, as in so that it will come back? Um, what is the difference between a vaccination and a cure? Okay, so vaccination trains your body how to protect itself. Yeah. Therefore, when you are contracting the actual disease, you will be ready. Okay. But it doesn't mean that you might not get sick, you might get sick slightly less okay. than you would with actual disease. When it comes to the cure, it's something that once you are infected and you're sick, the cure will help you to fight this pathogen. It might, for instance, work directly on the pathogen itself. Okay, okay, got you, all right. So, very interesting, not gonna lie. Um, I'm gonna switch gears into kind of what we're facing globally at the moment, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and before we dive into that, um, I actually do want to ask you, what is the difference between a epidemic, because in the beginning it was called an epidemic, and then it became a pandemic. Um, so what is the difference between the two? Okay, so um, the, the pan thing as itself, it means total. So it comes from Latin. So basically, uh, epidemic is on a smaller scale. Once it, the whole world became um, infected, the whole world was uh, involved in this. It was pandemic. So that's why you don't have to say global pandemic. It's already global in okay. the world itself. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self. Yeah. Um, and then a, another quick definition is COVID-19 versus coronavirus. Can we use them interchangeably? Is it the same thing? Okay, so when it comes to viruses, it's um, you can change, you can think about viruses as fruits. So um, we live in a country full of grapes, and you have different types of grapes, from which you can make different types of wine. So if you think about coronaviruses, we have grapes. Mm -hmm. Then you have different types of grapes. There are different types of coronaviruses. So uh, the one that is causing the biggest problem nowadays is one of the subtypes of those grapes. So if you basically nowadays people tend to use interchangeably coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2, which is not necessarily the same thing because it comes from the same family of things, but it's not the same as if you would take SARS virus. Okay. Interesting. So, 
they come from the same family, but yet they are different. They split at a certain point when it comes to mutations and they cause different things. Okay, but can, but then can one still say, I can still call it coronavirus because it is from the strand of coronavirus, but COVID-19 is the strand. That's what you say. So it's not wrong. Or is it wrong? Okay, when it comes to nomenclature nowadays, I've been trying to train myself now to stay up to date because all the literature, I've been telling you before the, the interview, all the literature is only emerging now. Um, so scientists came to the conclusion that COVID-19 itself is a disease. Okay. Now disease can be caused by a virus. So you have SARS-CoV-2. I know it's very complicated and gets people confused. So basically the virus itself is SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19 disease. Okay. Does this make sense? Yes. A little bit. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> uh, it's just like, um, so, yeah, this is basically a bit confusing initially when you listen to that, but yeah. in general, um, I think that the general population tend to uh, name things in the same way uh, so that they have the same association between COVID-19, coronaviruses. Um, what is important when it comes to actual medical science, medical communication, we try to distinguish those things because um, a couple of years back when you look on SARS, it was also coronavirus. Okay. And if you look on MERS, it was also coronavirus. But now they don't cause the same diseases. They don't come from the same animal and they don't occupy the same region. So mm -hmm. that's why we are trying to keep it you know, clear that there is distinction. Mm. And then quick question, just because you've mentioned both SARS and MARS, for those who don't know, what are the two that you had just mentioned? So again, those are coronavirus uh, causing, uh, coronavirus is causing diseases. Yeah. And a couple of years back, there were two different uh, situations. One was uh, SARS epidemic in China. Um, and that caused severe acute respiratory syndrome and people were dying from it but it was uh, contained relatively quickly uh, and talking relatively to the current situation. Mm. And then the other one was MERS, uh, Middle, Easter, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And that was also quickly contained um, in comparison with the current situation. Mm. And those two are, again, when it comes to microorganisms, those microorganisms come from this same group of microorganisms, but because they are genetically different, mm. they react differently with our own body okay. and therefore causing different type of diseases. Okay, okay, very interesting. Um, so coming back to COVID-19, <laughs> I'm saying it in slow motion because I'm like, yeah, I know I'm going to use them interchangeably, um, but I... I mean, as we discussed prior to this, even like we're not going to go intensely into like numbers or anything because literally on the hour, things are changing. New countries are, you know, getting it. Um, so it's a little bit tricky. So I am quite aware of the sensitivity around the topic, um, but we will look at it in the context of other diseases and viruses that the world has faced. Um, so which comes to my first question is, there are a number of, even in the last couple of years, some diseases that have spread like measles, we still get measles, um, Zika, you've mentioned SARS, MARS, um, the annual flu virus that pops up. What is the, but, but I feel it affected certain regions of the world at certain times. Whereas we have with coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, it spreading on this massive scale. Um, can you compare it to the other diseases on any level? Okay, so um, it's very difficult to compare it because uh, what you mentioned, you mentioned various human diseases, I would say, but the pathogens that cause them are different things. Okay. So it can be a virus, it can be a parasite, so that's one distinction. Now, uh, when it comes to those different diseases, 
it either is transmitted by um, a vector. So what we mean by vector is the mosquito, for instance, uh, like in case of Zika virus, or uh, it's uh, transmitted through animals, like in case of MERS, mm -hmm. um, those were dromedary camels, or it's uh, transmitted nowadays humans to humans, like in the case of COVID-19 disease. Mm -hmm. So what happens is uh, when we have mosquitoes, for instance, um, mosquitoes, it's a big umbrella term again for different types of organisms that are flying and biting us and they feed on blood, but, but, and, and they, they are annoying. But when you look on them <laughs> under the microscope, they are different. Mm. So, so some of them will live in more tropical regions. So, so looking only for uh, in terms of South Africa, we have uh, Kruger National mm. Park and up north where you can get malaria. You can get dead malaria from the mosquitoes that live in only that area. Mm -hmm. But in Cape Town, uh, the odds of you uh, getting malaria are very low, mm -hmm. uh, close to none, basically, because those mosquitoes are not occupying that area. So now uh, the same goes for the diseases you mentioned, like Zika virus, which was more uh, Southern American region. Um, and in Europe, you would not get it because those mosquitoes are not living in mm -hmm. Europe. So now when we look on MERS, which was dromedary camels, which was Middle Eastern uh, residing animals. And once there was a close contact with that animal, then people would get uh, infected. So yes, there is uh, quite a big variety and this is amazingly interesting world of infectious diseases. Mm. Now, when we have, let's say, avian uh, influenza, that in certain point we had, a, uh, we had an epidemic of that, mm. that was spread through wild birds. And those wild birds migrate. And they don't migrate in terms of migration from Cape Town to Johannesburg. They will migrate from Asia to Europe. And they would infect um, local animals, local chickens. And lock and poultry had to be, you know, culled to yeah. get rid of the virus. So if you know which animal it comes from or which type of, let's say, arthropod, like in case of mosquitoes, it's slightly easier to navigate around protection and preparedness mm -hmm. for the disease. So you know if you go to Kruger, you need to take malaria pills. You know if you go to uh, Southern America, you might encounter Zika. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to disease like COVID-19, now it's spread between humans. Mm. So that's why there was, why there was this whole uh, point of point locking down of the borders, of the borders, of the borders to migrate, yeah. to migrate so that they wouldn't that spread, they wouldn't spread yeah. Yeah. Humans, humans to humans. humans. Yeah, that's, that's why, why the lockdown, lockdown is so essential, essential to contain the disease. disease. Yeah. Um, because you don't yeah. want yeah. that. You don't want the interaction between yeah. infected yeah. people with non-infected people. And, and the tricky thing about COVID-19 is that you can be asymptomatic and not know that you're infected. Mm -hmm. And so then let's say, yeah, you sneeze because something tickles you, and even if you're, you're not infected, you don't have fever, you don't show symptoms, you yeah. still will leave that trace behind. The next person will, you know, yeah. wipe the bug um, of the shelf and get it yeah i read something very interesting i mean <laughs> about the kind of the what is it the incubation period that COVID 19 stays in your body for so with the normal annual flu virus where you might show symptoms a day you know or two days after you catch the cold you sneeze you're cold you know that's what it is but with COVID 19 it's 14 days up to 14 days and so in all of these cases where you do find people walking around or interacting or engaging with people, you're carrying it around. As you said, you're not showing the symptoms, but you could definitely pass it on in various ways. Um, and so just chatting about that incubation period, is that a natural incubation period? Do we naturally have diseases in us right now that are just being incubated for long periods of time or just are inactive? Well, there are different types of diseases. So again, because it's such a broad world, 
yeah. uh, you might be a carrier and not know about certain things. That comes to STDs. So uh, when it comes to STDs, and I'm sorry to mention yeah. it, <laughs> yeah. not all STDs will show on your body immediately. And uh, one of the STDs will be HIV, yeah. which will give you eventually AIDS. Mm. And as you know, South Africa has quite high rate of HIV infected people. Mm. And now HIV can uh, persist in your body and be do dormant for some time. And yeah. suddenly it will attack and trigger all the problems which will lead to AIDS. Uh, when it comes to, I believe, chlamydia doesn't show symptoms in males. Okay. So I love how the like diseases. diseases you've spoken to speak about is this an educational. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it is the case and we are in the 20s and let's face it, <laughs> we need to remember about that. It's for real, we do need to. Yeah, that's very interesting to know. And so, I guess in any, I, I guess one of the fascinating things that I'm trying to, coming back to like this whole vaccination and vaccine stuff, I would love for you to talk us through how one goes through finding a vaccination. I've heard things like 18 months. Um, I've heard things, I mean, we've heard a lot. But even as a scientist, like how do you go about, how are the scientists in the world? Because we're just sitting back, we're doing what we can do, we're washing our hands, we're self-isolating we are sneezing into our elbows, we are trying to be as healthy and protective as much as possible, but what are the scientists doing? What is going through their mind? Hey, uh, so what is going through the mind is a lot of things because um, you have to know how virus will interact with your body to enter your cell. So one important thing about viruses is that it's not a living creature, it's a parasite. So virus itself is unable to replicate and um, create more of the viral particles. It needs you. So before we started chatting, I told you about smart and dumb viruses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's my personal distinction. And I don't take any credits and don't take me um, as a scientist uh, word for word on that. But I think that because viruses um, are not living creatures, they can't replicate themselves. And that's how you define a creature, a uh, living thing. Uh, so they need to attach to your body, attach to your cell, enter that cell, use all your replication mechanism to create more viral particles. Okay. And if it's going to do it um, while destroying all your systems and killing you as a host, then it's stupid because uh, the human will realize you're sick. Yeah. Or you will die before the virus manages to spread. So does when you before die, it manages does, does the virus it? die with you? Yes. Okay. It can happen. So it won't That's why in some cases of Ebola outbreak, yeah. there were, um, if there was a rural village, and basically those people would be contained and the virus would be contained to that village. Mm. So the moment that those people start like migrating and uh, when they're infected or people would come and you know all those traditional things would be happening and then the virus gets a chance to jump to new host. Okay. So yeah that that's the point when we uh, figure out how the virus attaches through which um, so um, membrane particles which proteins what mm. is what kind of mechanism it's going to be using mm. that's the point where we can pinpoint okay this is what we have to target okay that's one thing okay. that's for the treatment okay so let's say we would try to find the cure so we would try to block the uh, receptor for which the virus is binding to your cell okay so we try to create a competition for that virus so the virus can't attach to your cell anymore. Okay. Uh, but when it comes to vaccination, we want to find on the surface of the, um, if you think about the virus as a ball and mm. it has those spikes, right? Mm. We want to find the spike that it's present on each and one of viral particles. Okay. So it's conserved through all the viral particles. So this particular spike will be recognized by your own body, by your cells, 
and therefore we can create a vaccination against that spike. Okay. So once this virus enters your body, your body will recognize the spike and will attack the viral particle. Mm, mm, okay, okay. But how do so you... That's why when it's completely new, it's very yeah. difficult to, to get to that point. Okay. So, but like right now in a lab, so they've now extracted the COVID-19 virus. By the way, does the virus look like what the people are saying it looks like on TV? Because it's like that like red or green like thing with the like, is, is that what it looks so like? So when it comes to coronaviruses, they get their name because they have a crown. Yes, it does look like that. So yes. Okay. And so, <laughs> and so you've got it. <laughs> Under your telescope in the petri dish that's what i remember from biology is that is that where it is is that where you put it it's a bit slightly more complicated slightly more nano <laughs> so you really need to go deep <laughs> um, but um okay so but you're observing it under a microscope under a microscope you're are you adding the thing that you think will be the vaccination for it to the actual virus how do you test it? Because I know we're going, uh, I, know, I know this is your, it's quite a broad question, but I know we're doing human trials right now as well. Or well, there are human trials that will happen or are ha in the process of happening. At what point do you take it from, we think this is working to now let's inject it in a human because I'm assuming we might react differently to what you're injecting us with. Because based on in the beginning of the podcast, where you just spoke about vaccinations. If it's not the right vaccination, you could just be, injecting something into someone okay so when we have time there are a lot of red tapes okay uh, for purpose of safety of course um i don't want to sound very controversial but it's gonna sound very controversial i know that now with the whole outbreak people are trying to speed up the process yeah. just to be on top of the things because people are so scared of yeah. what is happening so they are lifting a bit of those uh, red flags. It doesn't mean that the vaccination that will be created will not be safe. So don't get me wrong. Okay. Uh, the first point is always the safety of humans. Okay. So um, obviously there are first tests, you know, uh, on cell cultures, but then there are tests on small animals, mm. bigger animals. Mm. Um, we are going to primate which basically are the closest related to humans. Mm. And once that's fine, then you're having the um, clinical trials. And first they are testing the safety before they would even merge it together with the virus. Okay. That's why it takes so much time. Oh, I see, I see. So because of the safety aspect, it's gonna take a lot of time. Okay, so is, is plus minus maybe plus 18 months is that a reasonable time period to yes. maybe okay unfortunately for vaccination yes. Yes. but at the moment what the people are trying to do is uh, testing different drugs that would happen in states with you know the, those bloopers from trump when he said things that weren't <laughs> and that weren't tested yet um about certain drugs yeah um, that seem to be efficient to treat patients with COVID-19. Okay. So, uh, because those drugs were already approved, all okay. those safety measures were already taken just for different disease. Okay. So now we see this disease in the population, so we are going to try to see if it's going to work. Because if it's going to work, that's terrific, because we have the production line, we have the drug, all the safety measures were already taken. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of adjusting the dose and going with it. Okay, interesting. Um, so then you don't need to find a new drug because you already have it on the market. 100%, okay, with you. Um, and then I guess coming back to the kind of the context of being an SA in South Africa, um, I guess one of the positive things, not just from South Africa, but from kind of the entire continent is how a lot of the leaders in various countries responded. So they were quite, in comparison to some other countries overseas, we were quite quick to shut the borders. We were quite quick to stop the flights. And yes, it has caused, 
you know, another <laughs> number of other things like, you know, as you know, being at home all the time, but I think our safety, that is one thing we can be certainly grateful for. Um, yeah, I guess my question is with the time period versus what was happening in Africa or on the African continent versus what happened overseas is, do you think that is something that will benefit us in the long run or is COVID-19 something that just sees no bounds? It doesn't matter. Well, at the moment, we don't really know what is going to be the seasonality of COVID-19. There are a lot of speculations. So uh, it seems that Northern Hemisphere, where um, there is winter, it's more prevalent than here with the Southern um, Hemisphere, where we have still end of summer getting to autumn. So that's one difference. Um, but the other difference is, as you mentioned, it's the continental socio-economical difference. Yeah. We have quite a huge discrepancy between um, different groups of society. Mm. And um, as we spoke before, the HIV and TB prevalence in uh, South Africa, for instance, is a massive problem mm. because once those diseases will overlap, we don't know what we're going to face. Yeah. when it comes to healthcare system. Yeah. That affects the um, underfunded, underfunded uh, healthcare system, which is another issue. And you can't compare um, the healthcare system here to healthcare system in the States or Italy. Mm. So um, that's why I personally think that uh, what our president did here in South Africa, our president has been here for long enough, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a great idea yeah. because um, we as more um, vulnerable society, we need to think about that. Mm. We need to protect people as soon as it's possible. Yeah. Because yes, yeah. the, the crashing of healthcare system that was much richer than the South African healthcare system was already visible. So learning from their problems, we need to implement better strategies, definitely. Mm. And touching and lockdowns, on lockdowns, yes, it's uh, it's almost close to impossible in places like townships or yeah. rural areas in different African countries. So mm. we, as people who can afford being home, locked down, let's take advantage of that and just stay home. Yeah, to protect others. Basically. Yeah, and I was actually going to ask you on that. It's the lockdown is easier when you are living in a household where it's just you and someone else or you and your family and your garden and that's great but the realities of south africa is the inequality is the amount of people who live in townships and rural areas there are a number of socio-economic factors that we need to take into consideration when someone when we do say we're on a lockdown um because then is it healthy or is it fine to actually force someone who lives in a room with 10 other people to say you can't go outside and if they step outside you end up beating them in the streets like is like i don't know for me it's i understand the reason for the lockdown but i'm also like you know yeah i totally understand your point and where you're coming from and i think like this was a big discussion like you know behind the camera behind you know this whole decision of how it's going to be possible for people, you know, it's one thing to, to stay in a house uh, with 10 other people. The other thing is to stay in a house when you are basically with your op oppressive, let's say, partner, mm. which is also a thing to consider. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I don't think it's possible for townships to be on complete lockdown. It's not feasible. Mm. Um, but... Uh, there are so many people in uh, suburbs who can stay on a lockdown yeah. and they definitely should and they should stick to those rules. Okay. And that's how we're going to be slow down the, the infection rate. Mm. Because okay. it did start, let's say, from people who were traveling. Mm. So as long as those people, those people probably are not living in townships, I would say, because of the social economical differences. So once those people can at least stay home and get this, through this disease and not spread it around, that would be much better for slowing down the spread. 
Mm, okay. And then I've got one last question on this section before we jump into your 20s journey. Um, is I was in Joburg literally just before President Cyril Ramaphosa's first speech where he spoke about locking down borders and, you know, not being able to travel or just lessening travel. And I had flown from Joburg where I was with my sister to Cape Town, back where I was staying. And I got home and I don't know if it was something that was in my mind, but I started feeling all of the symptoms that are associated <laughs> with COVID-19. So they said because of the, because of how close it is to the cold or, you know, natural things. So like, I mean, I stay with, I stay with my little sister. So I said to her like the one day I was like, I'm actually feeling a little bit warm. Um, and then like, if I sneezed once, in the day, I was like, oh my gosh. And then you start freaking out and then you don't know what's happening. We were indoors, but I think it ha it's like, at what point do you say to yourself, actually, this is not just, this is not in my mind where I'm feeling a bit feverish because what we do as humans naturally is we're like, I'm feeling X, Y, Z, I'm gonna over-medicate. Not over-medicate, not over-medicate, take that out. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some medication. So I'm gonna be on Carenza, I'm gonna do everything, I'm gonna take Vicks, I'm gonna do everything. I can possibly do. Um, so I think that's the other thing is because it naturally, even from the stories I've heard of people who have caught COVID in the beginning, is it does seem like a cold. Yes, that's that's what people say, that it does seem like a cold for people who are initially healthy, so they don't have other um, comorbidities. And by comorbidities, which is a big word, I'll say, like you say, um, asthma or um, higher blood pressure, this sort of things. Mm. So that would be considered comorbidity. Uh, if you don't have that, um, anything undergoing, then it seems like a cold. So basically, yeah. um, for sake, sake of protecting yourself and your family members, just stay home and stay home for those working days, lock mm. yourself down. Mm. And um, Yes, I'm, I'm not going to say at this point that, you know, we are able to definitely say that that was a cold, which is caused by different virus than COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if your symptoms get worse, you have tightening of your chest and mm. huge buildup of the mucus. You have struggling, you're struggling with breathing. That's mm. the immediate, like, call the emergency services, say okay. that those are your symptoms. Okay, okay. I've got it. Because apparently that, that's basically that level of, okay, this is the cutoff point. We need to go to the hospital. We mm. need to like, proper treatment. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Good to know. Um, and then super quick, rapid <laughs> question um, is there are obviously a number of ways that we have been notified about, you know, being protect, protected, being health conscious, being safe, washing our hands, staying indoors. Um, is there any value added precautionary measure that you would want to share with people? Well, the, the precautionary measure that is at the moment recommended is basically washing your hands for 20 seconds, uh, sticking to alcohol-based hand sanitizers. And by alcohol-based, it's minimum 65% to my understanding nowadays. Okay. Um, there is this whole discussion about uh, wearing gloves where people, on one hand, it would be good because we see it in the hospitals. On the other hand, if people don't wear it properly, because I have seen photos of people still eating, you know, uh, snacks, using their gloves and touching their face, using their gloves, it doesn't make sense mm. because you're basically doing the same with what you would, do, would be doing just with gloves on. So you just spread the virus further and you infect yourself. Okay. Okay. And the same goes with masks. People think I'll wear a mask. And um, because this virus comes from Asia and they're traditionally, they are wearing masks already mm. on a day-to-day -day basis, like in Japan. Um, I would think that wearing a mask makes sense only if you are doing it correctly. And since people tend not to do it correctly, then what's the point? Because mm -hmm. I go to the supermarket and I see a lady who has a mask underneath her nose, so it doesn't protect her or anyone else. Okay, okay. And I highly doubt that the same lady would go home and wash this mask with hot water and sanitize it properly. Okay. It just doesn't make sense. 
And the other problem is that because in hospitals um, there's lack of supplies, because people tend to buy it, the general population who normally would not buy it, they are now buying it and hoarding it. Mm. And people who actually are on the front line and know how to use it, know how to protect it, they don't have their own protection. Yeah. So that's the problematic thing. Okay. So when it comes to masks, I would not recommend it. That's my personal at the state of the day. Is I don't recommend it just because people don't know how to use it properly and the masks that they are using currently are not sufficient anyhow. Mm. Interesting. So they can harm themselves and others more that way. Mm. Mm. Um, and then quick question, have you checked out the Department of Health's WhatsApp group? Although not WhatsApp group, but WhatsApp um, kind of yes I, I i did i did see it yes yeah yes, I'm i mean it's so helpful um i definitely will leave the number somewhere on one of these platforms uh, but i think that's been so great in terms of you know reaction from the government to say like everyone has a cell phone this is information that you can get about yes. symptoms about who to call about where to go um but that's been great all right. no, that's, that's totally a great platform and the other the up-to-date uh, platform is an ICD yes. website where you can see all the stats and it's uh, divided per province so that's also something that is important so you know in your local community how many cases there are at the moment as well. Okay, fantastic. We'll check it out. Um, all right, so we're going to quickly switch gears for the last about five minutes, um, and we're going to talk about your 20s journey. I'm so fascinated. Sorry, I, I mean, I studied media. Um, I'm in the media industry, but like things like science and all of these things that are out of your element are so interesting, um, especially like the videos that are coming up. I find it so fascinating. But anyway, uh, in this part of the podcast, there'd usually be a song, a jingle that would transition us, but now I'm just going to say transition. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna <laughs> go. Into, okay. <laughs> um, so on your twenties journey, um, Martina, how would you summarize your twenties journey thus far? Well, it was quite a ride, I must say. <laughs> um, I basically left home knowing what I want to do, and then I got very confused with my life. Mm. And uh, yes, I'm at the point where I still want to figure out what exactly I want to do. And I don't think anyone has it properly figured out, but it just seems that we are observing everybody going, following some tracks and, and thinking everybody knows what they're doing with their life, but they don't. They just improvise. We're just improvising. I like that. Um, and then have you ever, or did you ever go through the quarter life crisis in your 20s? Uh, yes, I did. I did go through that crisis. Um, so what happened in my case was that I wanted to be that scientist in the front line. And it's so funny to say it now uh, with the whole outbreak, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I wanted to be the scientist who will be there in the front line and doing all the tests and being all the badass as you can be. Yes. Um, and what happened to me was that um, I got a repetitive strain injury uh, from lab work okay. uh, during my PhD in both of my hands. So what, what is I should what stop is doing the lab work. What does that look like, the repetitive strain injury? So just uh, basically, um, it's a bit of a taboo what I noticed among scientists. Uh, a lot of us have some kind of problems with their hands. So um, either you get ganglions from doing the same thing over and, and again, and those are like small growths that are, um, they are not threatening your life. They just can press on your nerve and then this whole hand will hurt you. You can get carpet tunnels and it happens in a lot of professions. It happens for um, makeup artists or hairdressers, a lot of people who work with hands. So in science, what is important is your thumb. Thumb should be like a separate, you know, um, insurance policy on your thumb. Okay. <laughs> because without thumbs, it's very hard to work in the lab. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, a lot of people have problems with their thumbs. And when I start talking to people in my institute even, um, 
a lot of people struggle with that, with their hands in some way, one or the other. And once that happens, you start questioning yourself and your choices, basically. Mm. So that's what happened to me. And uh, I've been told by my doctor to, to stop doing what hurts me. And that was science. And that was just like a massive train smash for me. Yeah. And at that time, I didn't know what to do. I basically went through all st stages of grief and depression. Um, and only now I'm figuring out how to use my, my knowledge to actually do something about science. Mm -hmm. Just can't be in the lab. But, but yes, that was a big change. Yeah, it's very interesting. And also, you recently wrote an article about the five stages of grief within a pandemic. Um, what were, what are the five stages, particularly in a pandemic? Oh, well, uh, so basically um, I was struggling. What helps me to deal with my own emotions is writing. So, um, what happened to me when I noticed uh, what is happening worldwide is that I struggled with the same stages as when someone dies in your life and you go through stages of grief. So you get through, um, denial and anger um, so initially it was like no this is it's disease out there it doesn't bother me I'll read the scientific literature but it's not something that I should be concerned about uh, then you're getting upset and angry because it, no it actually um, refers to you because it influences all your plans and it might be a bit selfish because obviously you know um, you think about yourself at the moment. So if you tend to normally focus on everybody around you, then oh, I need to cancel my own plans. I should should be fine with it, but I'm not. You get angry. There's a lot of confusing emotions at, at that stage. And what is happening also from science point of view is a lot of people go to you as a person, as an expert, because you studied it, you, you know what is happening or you should know. Um, but it's quite difficult to catch up with all the literature that is ap appearing out there. Mm -hmm. And um, even with my family, when I was trying to calm some members of the family down, they, uh, they were arguing with me that it's, yeah, that it's very difficult situation. So yes, the anger was there, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and then you're slowly getting through and depression after cancelling all your plans, all your international conferences, and you have to take your work home, terminate all your experiments you've been doing. So like I'm on the last year of PhD and I don't have that time. I don't have extension anymore. I don't have visa anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh, you're facing all those difficulties and you have zero clarity on what's going to happen. And again, I refer to my personal point of view. I believe that anyone had the same problem uh, and is going through similar stages of grief in a way. And now I have acceptance. Now this is the situation where you are. You're on a lockdown for 21 days, maybe longer, and you have to deal with it. Mm. So those are the stages, at least those are the stages that I described and everybody is still going through. And yeah. I think it's okay to talk about it and I think it's okay to talk about the emotions we are going through. Mm. Because um, um, in this stage that we are with the pandemics and the social isolation, there will be a lot of mental health problems coming up. And one of the problems with depression is lack of talking about it, lack of talking about the emotions that we deal with on a day-to-day basis. And that leads to further, you know, burying yourself in, in this uh, grief, basically. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And I think it's so important. Um, it is something that I definitely would like to unpack um, on one of the um, up and coming episodes of the podcast is that, you know, the talking about it. But I think I've found through conversations with people, there are kind of two sides of the coin right now. On the one hand, you have people who are like, this is a period of rest and relax and, you know, find yourself, find your center. And on the other hand, you have people who are like, this is the time where I need to upskill and I need to do things. And 
because we're all in such a sensitive period when those two kinds of people meet and have a conversation, it's quite explosive because they're like, why aren't you upskilling? And then it's like, uh, why aren't you racing? Um, but knowing yes. that it's okay, that no matter what you're feeling, it's okay to feel that way. I think that's what people yes. need to know and you need to handle it the way that's best for you, not what's best for society or others or your siblings or your parents or your friends. Um, but no, it's totally. And at the same time, you know, like for me, the problem was that I'm not from here. So my family was calling me with all the panic in the world. And um, that's one of the, the scares that you have. Then uh, you might have a family member who is on the front line and you're going to be scared about them mm -hmm. because the whole situation is impacting you yeah. and them at the same time. So you try to calm yourself down through, let's say, scientific literature. But on the other hand, you know that they are out there and they are in danger. Yeah. So it's very difficult. And if you're trying to be, you know, um, this kind of beacon of calmness for your family but you're freaking out at the back of your head it's quite difficult and it's you need to tell yourself it's okay to be with all those emotions mm. and let it out yeah it's okay to not be okay key yes exactly um yeah. and then final question is i guess what advice would you have for people right now um who are watching who will be watching um yeah just i guess advice in general i mean sometimes we we lock it down to advice to people in their 20s but i feel like these upcoming conversations are so beneficial for a wider audience and a wider like people who just want to be informed and listen to different perspectives on what people are going through um so what advice do you have or would you want to leave well um i tend to overwhelm myself and i tend to to wake up and think i will make the whole list of things and um, as you're saying i'll take the 21 days and progress my life and educate myself take one day at a time make a plan but it's okay not to stick to that plan try to do your 100 percent but forgive yourself if you're not going to make it that day and try to accept the current situation and don't put too much pressure on yourself because we are already on, under so much pressure and everybody has their own opinions so just take it one day at a time read the information that is out there about the spread read the recommendations from your local authorities stick to them don't get arrested for doing some stuff <laughs> but also take it easy on yourself as you said it's okay not to be okay so it's okay to take a Saturday on Monday and binge watch some series and then make a Monday on Tuesday. We are in that situation when it is okay. <laughs> okay, okay. I like that, I like that. I'm gonna be taking a couple of Saturdays. I think I'm gonna plan my day Monday, Tuesday, Saturday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. <laughs> Yeah, you never had that opportunity and now you do. Now I do. And yeah, but but also remember that um, if you're going to constantly not do anything, you might get into a very depressive stage of, oh, I wasted seven days straight. So, yeah, try to at least, you know, do something for yourself and take care of yourself, whether it's moving, whether it's yoga. Yeah. It's just simple. Jay Shetty has the online breathing live at 7 p.m. on our local time every day. Meditation. So try to do something. Don't stay in pyjama the whole day and do completely nothing because that is also bad for your mental state. <laughs> Note to self. I'll get out. I'm out of my pyjamas. I'm fine. <laughs> um, okay, yes. Yeah, I know. Team non pyjamas. Well, top half anyway. At least um, the upper part, right? <laughs> I can see it uh, but I did want to say thank you so much this has been very informative I mean even our discussion before this was very informative for me this discussion has been very informative um, I feel like I've been upskilled mentally as well um, and oh oh it said my live video has ended you got stuck oopsie <laughs> I think you could only live video for an hour but I did want to just say thank you so much um, I will, oh, you can't hear me anymore. Hello? <laughs> Can you hear me now?
Hello. Okay, I'm gonna say thank you so much. For I can hear you. Oh, I can hear you. Wait. I can hear you loud and clear. Loud. Hey. Oh yes, now I can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me when I, I start singing. But thank you so much for today. I really, really, really appreciate it. Um, I wonder if, ooh, I don't think they'll join us back on the live video that we cut, but it was great to have people on the community on the live stream. Uh, to everyone else, we are gonna attempt to be doing these conversations every Tuesday and every Thursday. Don't hold me to my word, at least once a week we will come to you. <laughs> if not both Tuesday and Thursday, it will be every Tuesday and Thursday, right here on In My 20s. Now, round one. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so happy. This is really good. I will chat to you soon. <laughs> I'll chat to you just now. After this, I'll call you. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.